Uh, let me welcome all the viewers today for this webinar on impact of COVID-19 on insolvency laws in Singapore. I have two very eminent people with me today. Uh, Professor Wa Y. Yi Wan. Professor Wan is Associate Dean, Research and Internationalization and Professor of School of Law at City University, Hong Kong. Prior to joining City University, she, in January 2020, she was with Singapore Management University, where she last held positions of Dean of Postgraduate Research Programs and Professor of Laws. Before Professor Van joined Academia, she was partner at Allen & Gledel in Singapore, where she practiced mergers and acquisitions and equity capital markets. Her main areas of research in corporate laws and merger acquisition, security laws, financial, consumer regulation, and global restructuring and insolvency. Welcome, Professor Van. We also have with us Professor Orello Martinez. Professor Orello is Assistant Professor of Law at Singapore Management University, where he teaches company law, financial and securities regulation, comparative and international insolvency laws. He's also the head of the Singapore Global Restructuring Initiative and co-chair of the SMU 3CL Cambridge Roundtable on Corporate Insolvency. Professor Relu has taught, studied, and researched at various institutions in the United States, United Kingdom, and continental Europe, Asia, and Latin America. And some, very, some of the preeminent institutes includes Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, Columbia Law School, Stanford University, and Oxford University. Professor Rello is also a member of the steering committee of In Insol International Academia Ac Academic Group. And I also make, must make a mention here that uh, we at GIP consider Professor Rello as a friend. He takes lectures, guest lectures for us. Now, I welcome the speakers and I'll leave, I'll leave the floor to you to take it forward. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Niti. Um, so I would start um, by thanking um, the Center for Insolvency and Bankruptcy, Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, um, for giving us the opportunity to be able to make the presentation um, in, on um, COVID-19 and impact on insolvency laws in Singapore. Um, in particular, I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Avashi Shahi for um, uh, handling the technical aspects uh, in relation uh, to the webinar. So in terms of the format, um, the plan is that um, I will spend about 20 minutes um, going through the background, um, the responses of the Singapore government, um, in particular the legislative responses and overall assessment um, of the legislation. And uh, Aurelio will um, continue with um, um, making the assessment in the context of international developments, um, as well as um, any other of the international developments relating to insolvency laws, um, and um, he will conclude. Uh, we would leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so let me uh, start uh, with the background. Um, as we are all aware, um, the COVID-19 um, has been generating dramatic consequences in a number of respects, including uh, social perspective, but also affecting the global economy. Um, this is a public health crisis that has led to the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Um, in terms of the impact um, on um, the uh, businesses, um, they have been unable to generate revenues and cash flows. Um, there have been a number of consequences flowing, um, including uh, businesses are unable to pay their employees, which then lead to many individuals uh, whose jobs are at risk. Um, there's uh, the Businesses are unable to pay the landlords and suppliers, which then leads to a contagion effect because they themselves would then be unable to pay their employees as well as uh, would affect the supply chains. Um, the inability to pay the financial creditors will lead to a risk to financial stability um, of the economy. And um, with the closure of the businesses and the wave of potential corporate insolvencies, what would be the impact on the economy and what would be the impact on the judicial uh, system? Uh, the policy responses um, thus far um, by um, uh, most countries can be divided into uh, three parts. One is the economic measures. The economic measures uh, would include uh, wage subsidies, stimulus bills, 
um, financial measures, including um, the lending policies, uh, fiscal and monetary policies that are put in place, and the legal responses, uh, which cuts into uh, insolvency law, contract law, corporate law, uh, and financial regulation. So um, for the purposes of this uh, webinar, uh, we are looking at the um, Singapore response. Um, so uh, in terms of the uh, uh, of the legislation, the most significant uh, legislative response to curtail the fallout of COVID-19 was the passing of the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act uh, 2020. Um, this took effect um, in the uh, April 2020, um, 20th April 2020. The aim of the legislation is for it to serve as a what we call a pause button. Uh, we will give the individuals and businesses temporary protection from the lawsuits arising um, from our, our COVID-19 events. And we also it also makes it more difficult uh, for creditors to bring winding up petitions uh, uh, against the debtors uh, on insolvency grounds. Um, this legislative reform, of course, uh, is in the backdrop of the economic relief. Um, it's 60 billion Singapore dollars or 42 billion uh, US dollars, a package which represents approximately 12% of the GDP. And the economic relief uh, takes the form of uh, which subsidies, cash payouts, government supported loans. So the combination of the legal and economic responses was uh, to uh, uh, the aim is to keep the businesses alive in a hibernation mode uh, while the pandemic uh, takes place and when it is over. Uh, when by keeping the businesses alive, uh, alive um, the aims are avoid closure of the businesses, avoid as many layoffs as possible, and also avoid a situation where uh, the judicial system is unable to cope due to the wave of corporate uh, insolvencies. So how does the uh, legislation uh, work? Um, the legislation is, in, in a sense, uh, uh, unprecedented, um, but steps needed to be done because um, in terms of the uh, people who are most at risk um, from the COVID-19, at least at the immediate front, uh, we look at the individuals, the small and medium enterprises, what we call the SMEs, um, the, uh, and, and um, the uh, employers. Now, uh, SMEs are important in the Singapore economy because SMEs uh, actually account for 72% of the employment um, in, in Singapore. So the support was really needed uh, for, for, from that perspective. Uh, so the legislation uh, was passed uh, very quickly. Uh, 20th April, uh, it took effect 20th April 2020. Um, the uh, COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act, I will call it the Act for short. Um, the, in terms of the scope, they look at the contractual obligations to be performed on or after uh, 1st February 2020 uh, in respect of contracts that are entered into or renewed before 25th March 2020. Um, the 25th March 2020 uh, was chosen as the date where the effects of the pandemic uh, became it became quite clear there was going to be uh, a, a global um, pandemic and that um, if contracts were entered into after that date, I think the parties would have been aware of the issues and those will not uh, receive the protection. Uh, so contracts that entered into or renewed before 25th March uh, would be able to um, get the protection under the legislation. Um, there are five areas, um, but uh, there is the ability for um, the um, government to add further areas. Uh, the five areas uh, are leases for non-residential property. So um, uh, I will emphasize this is for um, the commercial property. It's not for residential property. The second uh, relates to construction and supply contracts. Um, the third uh, relates to event and tourism related contracts. Uh, the fourth uh, relates to higher purchase and conditional sales agreements. And the fifth relates to uh, the, uh, the secured loan agreements to the uh, SMEs. So um, the Act will take the duration of six months of being enforced with the ability of being extended to a year. Um, the relief that is granted um, is as follows. Uh, if there is an inability to perform, is to a material extent caused by COVID-19 event and notification for relief is served on the counterparty. 
So there are two aspects here, uh, which uh, I would highlight. The first is that uh, it is not any inability to perform. Uh, it is not um, uh, 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 the case where the party can call a timeout and and um, therefore refuses to perform. Uh, this has to be uh, to be a material extent caused by the COVID-19 event, and there has to be a notification for relief that is served on the counterparty. The counterparty will then wait for the expiry of the uh, prescribed period, uh, that case will be six months, uh, to take any enforcement action. So during this period of time, the aim is to encourage the parties uh, to the contract uh, to work together to resolve for non-residential property, the landlords cannot terminate the lease if the tenant is unable to pay rents for COVID-19 reasons, um, but the rent continues to accrue and will be payable after the circuit breaker period. Uh, so it's, it's a suspension, but not uh, a discharge. For construction contracts, um, the contractors uh, are able to have an extension of time to complete their works. Uh, so that is the relief that will be granted uh, under the legislation. Then uh, the uh, issue arises as to uh, what happens if the parties are unable to agree that there has been an inability to perform uh, the contract due to a COVID-19 event. So what if a party uh, argues that uh, the other party actually has, uh, has already been unable to perform the contract even before COVID-19? So uh, in such a case, the inability to, uh, to perform is really not a COVID-19 event. Or alternatively, the performance is defective and has nothing to do with COVID-19. Uh, in order to ensure that um, the process on um, the dealing with these disputes will be um, dealt with in a fairly uh, a streamlined manner, um, the disputes will not be uh, handled in the courts. Uh, instead, the assessors will be appointed by the Ministry of Law uh, to re resolve disputes arising from the application of the Act. Um, this is to enable uh, the disputes to be resolved uh, quickly rather than going uh, through the uh, court processes. So what are the implications then on um, insolvency law? Now, um, there are a, a number of um, temporary changes to insolvency laws that applies to companies. Uh, the first is that, um, uh, in general, if, you are, uh, if a company is unable or deemed to be unable to pay the debts, um, the, uh, it, uh, it is the, uh, the case that um, the creditor would be able to file a winding up petition against the company. Um, there is a presumption of inability to pay the debts uh, if the amount that is owing uh, is $10,000. So that filing threshold uh, has been increased 10 times to $100,000. Uh, this will make it um, more difficult uh, for the creditors to be able to bring winding up petitions. Um, for non-payment, um, so the way that it works is that um, if the creditor serves a statutory demand and that the demand has not been satisfied uh, within 21 days, um, the, there's a presumption of insolvency for which the creditor can take winding up petition. Uh, this 21-day period has been extended to six months in line with the circuit breaker period. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, it also um, provides a defense to wrongful trading, uh, which is a... Um, it is an offence for an officer of the company to who knowingly contracts a debt without expectation of company being able to pay it. Um, so long as the debt is incurred in the ordinary course of business during this six-month prescribed period and before the judicial manager or liquidator is appointed. So non-compliance with adherence to the legislation constitutes an offence. Um, so what are some of the um, major issues uh, that have been debated um, uh, in connection with the legislation. So an uh, uh, important point to emphasize is that um, this is an unusual piece of legislation. Uh, it is promulgated and interferes with the, um, the usual expectation of sanctity of contracts, but because these are also unusual situations. Um, so in terms of the, in, uh, of, uh, the interference to the party's autonomy, uh, the, the Act uh, is a, has a calibrated approach. Uh, the legal claims are not extinguished, they are suspended. So, for example, if there's inability to pay rent or perform an obligation, and um, that obligation is suspended, but it does, it's not extinguished. Um, the uh, relief also uh, uh, is only available if the inability to perform the obligation is to a material extent caused by COVID-19. Uh, the assessors will determine 
uh, what amounts to a material uh, to to an inability to perform to a material uh, extent. Uh, in the course of the parliamentary debates um, leading up to the enactment of the legislation, uh, one of the uh, major players in the market, uh, which is the the REITs, the Real Estate Investment Trust, um, which uh, uh, and also many of the commercial landlords um, raised the issue of um, that uh, fact that uh, if there's a suspension or rental suspension of commercial property, how does it affect um, the REITs? Because for the REITs, the expectation is that uh, they are the, have been the source of the stable payouts and, when, and how it would affect um, the standing of Singapore as an international financial hub. So the response um, of the government is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the uh, for, uh, on the part of the landlords, um, the, the the balance is reached in uh, deferring rental payment, but not a, a discharge. And in any event, uh, it is not the case that every single tenant is uh, allowed uh, is uh, is allowed to have the relief. Uh, there has to be the inability to perform the obligation or to pay rent. Um, so the causation element still needs to be um, to still needs to be shown. Um, the landlords. Uh, of course, we'll have other protections as well, um, including the fact that um, the uh, there is a wage subsidy that is put in place, um, as well as the credit lines that will be available. Uh, the crisis um, also exposes um, Singapore companies that have poor governance. In the case of Hinlong, uh, uh, it is commodities trader which has recently collapsed owing the lenders $4 billion. Um, this is not a direct result of the pandemic, but the pandemic has uh, exposed uh, these companies which have poor governance, uh, and these, uh, these cases have come uh, to, the, to the limelight. Um, so I think at this uh, point in time, I will um, hand over to Aurelio, who will discuss um, and assess as to uh, whether the insolvency system or the changes to the law on the insolvency uh, it will help and um, some of the international developments. Aurelio. Yeah, okay, thank you so much, Wei. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. It's great to be back here. So thank you so much for this kind invitation. Uh, I would like to thank personally to Dr. Niti and also to Urvashi for making this uh, exciting webinar possible. It's also a great pleasure to be sharing panel with my colleague, uh, Professor Wang Wei. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm gonna focus on two specific uh, aspects. So one is uh, something that actually not only applies to Singapore, but also we are going to analyze uh, globally, but also locally, which is the question if the insolvency system can actually help in the current situation. And for what I understand, this discussion is also very relevant in India nowadays because of the proposals to suspend uh, the debtor's ability to file for insolvency during the COVID-19 crisis. So hopefully this discussion will be helpful also for the discussion in India, even though um, we always need to take into account the particular features of each country, as I will mention now. And then the second part of my presentation will be more focused on analyzing, analyzing what Singapore has done compared to other jurisdictions. Because particularly in the context of corporate financial insolvency laws, it's always incredibly enriching to see what other countries do, what other people think, what other authors have suggested in order to try to come up with the most appropriate responses for our legislation. So first of all, I would like to address the question of can the insolvency system really help in this situation? And in order to answer that question, I think we need to go back to the basics, which is uh, the role and function of insolvency law. And I always tell my students that the role of insolvency law, actually insolvency law performs two primary functions. The first one is just to reduce the destruction of value uh, generally uh, generated in a situation of insolvency. So that's why the first role of insolvency law is to avoid or at least to minimize the destruction of value. So in other words, to try to preserve value. And the second role of insolvency law is to try to allocate the assets efficiently. And by allocating the assets efficiently, I mean depending on 
for example, companies which are worth more alive than dead, then the most efficient allocation of the assets will be reorganization. But if the company is worth more dead than alive, and that happens very often with many non-viable businesses because they generate you know, even negative cash flows, uh, the valuation, the value of the company as a going concern is lower than the value of the company liquidation. Then in those cases, what we need to do is just to liquidate the company even piecemeal. And then if there are parts of the business or even the business itself is economically competitive, attractive, viable, but maybe the problem is not the business itself, but maybe the shareholders and managers behind that business, what we need to do is to save the business, maybe by conducting a going concern sale. Again, this is the second function of insolvency law, to allocate the assets efficiently. But the first one is to minimize the destruction of value. And how can we do that? Well, insolvency law actually provides some fantastic tools to help us achieve this goal. And what are these tools? Well, the first and probably most important one is a moratorium. The existence of a moratorium will stop creditors from enforcing their actions and therefore destroying uh, going concern value of many companies. Uh, the second, uh, another example of this restructuring or insolvency tools that can help preserve value is, for example, the existence of avoidance actions. Okay, the avoidance actions are there to either deter ex ante before it happens these opportunistic behaviors by debtors, creditors, or others in the zone of insolvency, or if the, the, the avoidance actions didn't actually perform that ex ante function, then there will be there available in insolvency to try to remedy that ex post by avoiding those transactions and restoring the situations that you know was before the transaction took place. Then also depending on the jurisdictions and jurisdiction, for example, Singapore, the US, also allow uh, this idea of rescue or deep financing. And that can be another way, for example, because many companies in financial distress have trouble having access to new uh, financing. And that's why uh, insolvency law actually can help because in bankruptcy, in insolvency, they can make use of these powerful mechanisms to try to incentivize lenders to provide new financing. And by doing so, again, insolvency law can help us uh, reduce the destruction of value because in the absence of these new financing, companies might not be able to pursue value creating projects. Um, also, some tools existing, for example, in Singapore, but also in the US and other jurisdictions is this idea of restricting or prohibiting ipso facto clauses. So in other words, prohibiting or restricting the possibility of terminating contracts just because the company is insolvent. So that's why insolvency law is a fantastic uh, you know, tool to preserve value, to avoid the destruction of value. And then also the second function is to try to put that company to their best use. And if the company is economically viable, then the best use is gonna be reorganization. But again, only if the company is viable and the, and the creditors trust the shareholder managers. Otherwise, maybe a going concern sale is gonna be more important. So a moratorium, by the way, some people are asking, moratorium is also called in the United States an automatic stay, which is just to impose a stay on legal actions initiated by the creditors. So that's why the second function when the company is economically valuable is to reorganize the company. The problem is, how can we reorganize the company? How can we reach an agreement between debtors and creditors, particularly in cases where we have many dispersed and maybe uncoordinated creditors? Well, that can create a situation where uh, you know, many transaction costs are involved, many negotiation costs, many holdout problems. But insolvency law, again, provides us with some fantastic tools to promote efficiently this type of debt restructurings. And one of the tools that insolvency law provides is by changing, for example, the rule existing outside of insolvency, which is unanimity, we usually have, uh, we need to have 100% of the creditors on board in order to try to, to change their debt contract. 
But in insolvency, usually a majority or a qualified majority is enough. So that's why these type of tools will help us achieve also debt restructuring, which is, again, the most efficient allocation of the assets in the context of economically viable firm. So that's why if insolvency law performs this function, some people may say, well, in that case, insolvency law is the right tool to solve all the problems associated with the COVID-19 situation. Well, that's not the case, unfortunately, because there are many other issues. So some of them have been mentioned by my colleague one way, but there are other issues specifically related to the limitations of insolvency law. So for example, um, under a particular country's insolvency law, does the insolvency system really perform those functions? And this is again incredibly important to understand the context of a particular country. Because if, for example, the judiciary is not working well, uh, so a country doesn't have a sophisticated judiciary or an efficient judiciary, then debtors, even if they are economically viable, they can literally die during the procedure. So that's why those fantastic tools that they just described, rescue financing, moratorium, etc., might not even work because the, the, the judicial system has literally made those companies die. So that's why uh, we need to analyze uh, whether the insolvency system is, is working well, is properly performing those primary functions that insolvency law seeks to solve. Secondly, can the judicial system absorb the wave of insolvency cases that we will probably observe in the following months? Because this is important. This is, for example, a major concern right now in many jurisdictions. And for example, in the United States, a group of insolvency scholars have even written a letter to the U.S. Congress asking uh, the U.S. Congress to, uh, to appoint more bankruptcy judges during the COVID-19 crisis. That is also a recent article by Professor Mark Rowe from Harvard Law School, another author suggesting that in order to be able to handle the wave of insolvency cases, bankruptcy judges in the U.S. will need to work at least 100 hours a week. And still it's not clear if they will be able to manage the wave of insolvency cases. So that's why this is another important limitation and aspect to, to have in mind. Also, is the insolvency system adequate to handle situations of insolvency for all types of debtors? This is another incredibly important factor. For example, the US Chapter 11 or many uh, organization regimes around the world work well for medium-sized or large companies, but maybe it's not ideal for many micro and small companies. So that's why in Singapore, for example, we have been aware of that situation, and that's why many of the contractual provisions of the COVID Act are focused on SMEs in particular, as my colleague, uh, Professor Wally uh, mentioned. And that's why also UNCITRAL or uh, other jurisdictions, actually uh, the US recently implemented a change focused on SMEs, and UNCITRAL is working on uh, uh, guidelines or model law for a simplified regime for SMEs. So that's why uh, it's important to, to bear that aspect in mind. Maybe for large companies, the insolvency system can indeed help in this situation, but maybe not for many SMEs. Also, is the current insolvency framework enough or maybe we need some reforms? And actually, I am uh, among those that think that the insolvency system will that it need uh, a change in times of COVID-19. It's not uh, actually prepared to deal with the current situation. So that's why my colleague Wei has mentioned the reforms that we have implemented in Singapore. And now I would like to conclude by comparing those reforms that we have implemented with those that have been implemented in other jurisdictions around the world. So, for example, this is based, and it's uh, publicly available also, I will be very happy to send you the link to this, but this is based on a report that I co-authored for a project conducted by the World Bank and Insol International about insolvency responses around the world, and we have classified these responses into uh, common responses and less common responses, the common responses observed internationally, for example, include suspension or restriction of creditors' rights to initiate insolvency proceedings. So, for example, in Singapore, we have adopted that approach, the restriction, actually a very 
restrict, uh, a very strict restriction, I would say, because other countries like Australia, for example, have adopted a more, uh, you know, a softer version of our restriction. This has also been adopted in India and other jurisdictions by uh, making more difficult for creditors to initiate insolvency proceedings. But Italy, Spain, other countries have even imposed a suspension of creditors' rights to initiate the procedure. So in this case, Singapore has done something, and this is quite common uh, internationally. Also, uh, in some jurisdictions, particularly in continental Europe, directors are required to file for bankruptcy to put the company into uh, insolvency if the company becomes factually insolvent. So obviously that uh, duty has been suspended in many of the countries with this duty for corporate directors, such as Germany, France, Spain, and many others, uh, because otherwise, you know, there will be a huge wave of insolvency cases, uh, not because the companies might actually think that this is the most desirable solution, but because the law forces them to file for bankruptcy, even exposing the directors in Germany, uh, to criminal liability for uh, failure to comply with this obligation. So this one doesn't apply to us in Singapore and in most jurisdictions around the world outside of continental Europe. Then another common response is relaxation of liability for wrongful trading. So this one was proposed in the, US, in the UK. Uh, this one was also adopted in Australia and we have adopted that approach as well in Singapore. So groundful trading is a provision existing in many common law jurisdictions. So not in the US, for example, but in most uh, jurisdictions adopting the UK insolvency uh, regime or something similar have this liability regime. So these are a relatively common response observed internationally. And then other common responses observed internationally include amendments of transaction avoidance rules. So for example, in Singapore or in the Czech Republic, uh, the uh, look back period for transaction avoidance has been suspended. Uh, in Singapore, it will be suspended only for debtors that um, make use of this uh, relief that my colleague, Professor Wan Wai Yi mentioned. So if they get their relief for six months, and at some point in the future, they file for bankruptcy, they initiate insolvency proceedings, then uh, the, the look back period will be extended for six additional months. Uh, so we have adopted that approach. Uh, facilitation of rescue financing. There are some countries, for example, Colombia in Latin America, that has literally replicated the regime of rescue financing existing in Singapore and the US. And they have adopted that approach now during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and in the US or in Singapore, some authors, including myself, are saying that maybe uh, uh, the judges, the court should be uh, maybe more flexible with the interpretation of the regime for rescue financing in times of COVID. Uh, so that's why we haven't adopted any formal regime because we already have a regime of rescue financing, but it will remain to be seen how courts are going to interpret the provisions. Also some countries, Brazil, for example, and even Colombia have enacted new rules for small companies. In Singapore, we have rules for small companies, but outside of insolvency in the COVID Act, not necessarily in insolvency. New measures also have been adopted to reduce the timing associated with the commencement and duration of insolvency proceedings. Colombia, for example, is another example of, of these countries adopting this approach. Then many countries in continental Europe and Latin America subordinate shareholder loans. Um, for example, Italy, Germany, Austria, Spain, Colombia, Argentina, and many other countries subordinate shareholder loans. These loans, uh, actually, they are subordinated. Corporate insiders are not going to have incentives to provide new financing to the company facing financial trouble. So that's why this subordination has been suspended in many of these jurisdictions. Not in Singapore, because it doesn't apply to us. Um, then suspension of debtors' right to initiate insolvency proceeding uh, has been suggested in India. So uh, I've been uh, discussing this issue with actually some of you here. Uh, it will be interesting to see what the Indian government finally does on that. In my opinion, I mean, uh, I'm not quite, for example, in Singapore, the US in favor of adopting this approach. In India, you guys know more than me about the particular features of the country, but in my view, 
this extreme measure would only uh, make sense if the judicial system doesn't have the capacity to absorb the wave of bankruptcy cases um, existing in the following months. Secondly, if the government is unable to provide the resources needed to handle all of this, uh, the wave of insolvency cases. And thirdly, uh, only if the government provides some type of pre-insolvency, pre-restructuring mechanism. So in other words, so maybe the government may decide, okay, let's not use the insolvency system, but in that case, what should we do? Uh, because companies will still be facing financial trouble. So maybe the government might decide to suspend the uh, initiation of insolvency proceedings, but maybe to implement a moratorium outside of insolvency. And that's actually a solution that is being adopted in many jurisdictions around the world for pre-insolvency pre proceedings and restructuring and preventive frameworks, or even taking other restructuring tools, other insolvency tools, to be implemented outside of insolvency during the situation of COVID-19. But suspending the uh, use of the insolvency system without doing anything, I'm not so sure how desirable it might be. So, and just to conclude, I mean, in addition to these insolvency responses, um, we have observed in this study other uh, insolvency related responses some of them have been adopted in Singapore, such as the increasing use of electronic communications, for example, facilitation of workouts. So I have the intuition that, for example, in a country like Singapore, we will be having many workouts out of core restructuring in the following months for several reasons. So one is because, as my colleague Wang Wai mentioned, we have many SMEs. And that means that many of our companies have concentrated debt structures. In other words, companies just with a few creditors. So that's why the coordination costs are not going to be very high. It will be relatively easy to coordinate, to put together these creditors to uh, try to reach an agreement with the debtor. Secondly, because we have a rescue culture in Singapore, promoted by the Singapore Association of Banks and also by the government itself, uh, um, with all the measures that have been taken in the past years to try to enhance our restructuring framework. So that's why this type of London approach out of core restructuring uh, also exists in Singapore. And I think that can facilitate also uh, workouts. Uh, also because uh, now we have put in place many mechanisms in the COVID Act that might actually encourage parties to negotiate, such as the uh, order for relief mentioned by my colleague uh, Wang Wei. Um, so that can encourage also workouts, and also because Singapore is also a very small society, uh, there are many repeated players, and that the existence of repeated players will probably encourage this workout. Uh, so these are the uh, on uh, like insolvency related responses that have been adopted. There are many others that are not applicable to us in Singapore. Uh, because, for example, in many jurisdictions in continental Europe and Latin America, companies have a duty to promote the liquidation of the company or, the, or to recapitalize the company if the company's net assets fall below a certain percentage of the company's legal capital. That crazy idea doesn't exist, fortunately, in many jurisdictions outside of Europe and Latin America, so that's why we haven't implemented anything about that. So that's why, just to conclude, uh, yes, insolvency law can be very helpful, but it's not the panacea, okay? So this is an important message. So any attempts to save businesses need to be accompanied with a package of legal, economic, and financial uh, reforms. Still, uh, we personally think that insolvency law can be a useful mechanism because ex ante, the existence of the insolvency system and the existence of insolvency law, and even the threat to file for insolvency will encourage the parties to negotiate ex ante because they will know what they might get in the hypothetical scenario of uh, insolvency. And ex post, we have mentioned that insolvency law has some features and unique tools that can help us preserve value on the one hand and in the context of economically viable companies to emerge from insolvency with a, a new capital structure.
So in my opinion, the Singapore response uh, has been one of probably the most comprehensive ones because it has been pre-insolvency through contracts. It has been also in insolvency through a variety of measures. Uh, and also not only has been an insolvency response, but has been an insolvency response accompanied with a package of other economic and financial reforms. Because the whole purpose is to try to save businesses, but at the same time, to save employees, to save creditors, without harming legal certainty and without putting at risk the stability of the financial system. There are still some challenges ahead, what's gonna happen after the six month period uh, of our COVID, uh, when the COVID-19 uh, bill uh, act is going to expire, um, is the judiciary and even the profession gonna be uh, capable of absorbing the cases uh, that we're going to have in the following months? I personally think so, I think they will, uh, because again, as I mentioned, there are many reasons that made me think that there will be many out of court restructuring. So that's why our courts are not gonna be totally collapsed. I think the COVID-19 act also is gonna help and many other factors. But again, I just want to point out these challenges ahead. And again, thank you all for being here with us and thank also uh, the organizers for the opportunity to share some thoughts here with you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Van and Professor Rello. We have uh, one question. Uh, Dushant wants to know, is there any way to globally merge the case of insolvency matters? Uh, I'm not sure, Dushant, what do you mean by that? So do you so, mean... Sorry, what, what was yeah. the question, sorry? Dushant wants to know, is there any way to globally merge the case of insolvency matters? Dushan, would you like to clarify your question further? Because, uh, or would you attempt to answer that, Professor Ello? Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I, uh, uh, sorry, Aurelia, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think the question is asking uh, whether there can be a mechanism for which um, you can have the uh, a, a company uh, perhaps with several um, uh, like MNC with, with several um, branches or subsidiaries and whether you can um, uh, there, there's a way to be able to deal with um, cross-border insolvency in, in such a case um, the uh, this, this is a wider question uh, beyond COVID-19. So when uh, now we all know that uh, insolvency law is uh, one of those areas where local uh, uh, interests, local policies have been extremely important. And this has been one of the greatest impediments towards unifying um, the substantive insolvency laws. Now, uh, ANSITRA has done some uh, work in, in the respect uh, in relation to more of the procedural aspects of the uh, of recognition of foreign proceedings. Um, uh, but we have um, not actually even gone to the stage where um, uh, we will recognize judgments. ANSITRA has done some work on that, but um, that will still require the countries to be willing to uh, actually enact that into its uh, domestic law. So what we have right now uh, is that um, unfortunately, cross-border insolvency is messy. Uh, it, it, uh, there are uh, still several attitudes, uh, different attitudes towards um, cross-border insolvency. Um, the, the, many of the common law jurisdictions have moved towards a more universalist approach, which is, uh, which is that uh, we, would, uh, we would expect that uh, various insolvency proceedings take place in where the assets are, are located, but that uh, we will respect um, the place in which the center of, or the center of the main interest will deal with the assets, and the others and the jurisdictions will then um, uh, uh, give if uh, effect to the uh, to those proceedings. So, but we are still a long way away. Uh, um, uh, hey. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Van. Uh, Professor Ella, would you like to add something, or should I go to the next question? I think you can go to the next question because, I mean, uh, well, maybe a few words on that. I just uh, want to emphasize that now with the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, probably we'll, we will need more cooperation than ever. And for that purpose, uh, I think it would be uh, interesting to see how the model law on cross-border insolvency is gonna work. 
and how actually countries that haven't adopted the model law yet are going to handle this uh, wave of insolvency cases, some of them with an international component. So it might be a good way for them to test whether maybe the adoption of the model law would have been desirable or maybe not. But it's something that I think we will be uh, seeing an almost a natural uh, experiment in that sense in the following months to test the, the model law. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So the next question to the panel is from Vijay. And Vijay wants to know that Singapore court has recently authorized super priority financing after rejecting it in earlier cases. A dip like mechanism. What is the way forward according to your opinion? Okay, um, the uh, debtor in possession financing um, is uh, something which uh, is often um, necessary. Uh, in order for the um, company to be able to uh, restructure successfully. So um, if um, we, I think um, Professor Aurelio has mentioned that um, Singapore has, uh, the, the, the pattern is that um, even among the listed companies, the, there's a very high degree of concentration um, of, share, uh, of shareholding in, in the companies here. So when the company requires to restructure its business uh, uh, due to financial distress, uh, a logical place to look for uh, further financing would be the controlling shareholders. But so this is sometimes not forthcoming. Uh, to persuade the, uh, the the creditors to lend further, uh, usually they need some kind of an incentive and the incentive takes the form, I can take the form of uh, debt financing, debt possession uh, financing. Uh, under the legislation though, uh, the challenge, um, I think, in the earlier cases uh, has been that um, uh, that you do need to be able to show that you have tried to find other kinds of financing and hasn't been successful. Um, the, uh, however, this has uh, this. Uh, I don't think this is an indication that the courts will not grant debt financing. I think the courts will still grant debt financing if you can uh, have an appropriate case. Right. Uh, Professor Rella, would you like to add or should I move to the next question? Yeah, well, I totally agree with my colleague, Professor Wang Wei. Uh, deep financing can actually be a variable, uh, a very uh, valuable tool in solvency. But I also have to say, and in fact, in my research, I've also pointed out that we have to be very careful and very restrictive with the way we apply the provision for deep financing. Because, well, first of all, I would like to mention that there are many types of priorities associated with this new financing. So what do we mean by rescue financing in the first place? So uh, rescue financing usually is referred to the new financing obtained by the debtor once it is subject to an insolvency proceeding. And this new financing is gone that the lender is going to enjoy a uh, super priority. But there are many different types of super priorities. So for example, one priority can be just to get a lien over the unencumbered assets. And if that's the case, I'm not that concerned with that approach. Uh, I mean, I think courts should be very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very uh, keen to approve these type of transactions. But there are more controversial issues. For example, another type of super priority consists of putting the new lenders ahead of the existing administrative expenses claimants. And therefore, if you give that priority uh, and you put the new lender first, you are affecting pre-existing creditors' rights. So if you apply that on a regular basis, uh, I mean, in the absence of the COVID situation, lenders in that country might respond to this uncertainty, the uncertainty that at some point in the future they might be uh, uh, harmed by this type of decisions, they might respond with an increase in the cost of debt or by requiring more collateral to the debtor. So that's why a very generous regime of rescue financing can create problems of financial exclusion and increase the cost of debt in the country. And also there are other types of uh, priorities in rescue financing, uh, which is uh, when the new lender can even prime an existing lien. And this is by far the most controversial case. So Singapore now has adopted the single, the second one. Uh, still has been very restrictive, but it has finally adopted the second one, but not the third one yet, as far as I know. 
So will the current COVID situation change that and will make courts more, uh, you know, inclined to allow the super priority that I described as super priority two or super priority three? Um, let's see what is going to happen. Some leading authors, such as, for example, Professor David Skill from uh, from UPenn, um, he has been suggesting that courts should be more flexible with that. Um, we have been having some discussions on that. Um, I'm also uh, in favor of adopting a more flexible approach. So that's why let's see how it's going to evolve in, in the following months. It's going to be interesting to, to, to observe. It. Very interesting, uh, Professor Van and Professor Elo. The next question is, uh, uh, can insolvency law help in avoiding hostile takeovers during COVID-19? Uh, Professor Van, would you like to go in first to answer that question? Um, uh, sure. Um, I would say that maybe I'll start by giving the background. Um, hostile takeovers are very rare uh, uh, because um, the shareholding structures um, of listed firms here are still fairly concentrated. Um, so um, hostile takeovers are, are rare. Now, um, the if a company is um, uh, in financial distress, um, I suppose the question then is, uh, is it possible for uh, the um, distressed uh, debt market, uh, in the distressed debt market for the uh, for the hedge funds or the other funds to come in to purchase the distressed debt and then uh, ultimately take control of the uh, of the companies, um, this is an in, uh, this is um, not a phenomenon that we had seen yet, and it will be interesting to see whether um, uh, it, it will it will happen. Uh, I think the challenge still is that uh, on twofold. Uh, one is that um, insolvency law is only one part of the equation. Um, the in terms of um, uh, whether we can have a, uh, a situation where you have uh, funds that come in, purchase the distressed debt, and then ultimately uh, take control of the um, company. Um, I, I would also just add that uh, actually, um, when we uh, when you look at um, the whole pie uh, on on takeovers, uh, it's actually not so easy because uh, we also um, uh, have a situation where the uh, existing shareholders uh, do have some say. Um, I, I can go into this in, in greater detail, but um, we uh, we don't actually, uh, although we have adopted features of Chapter 11, we don't adopt all the features of top -up Chapter 11. So what I can say is that um, the, in, in Chapter 11, normally uh, what, what, what you see in the restructuring is that um, the, you wipe out the, uh, the shareholders because the company is out of the money. Um, in the Singapore context, um, the shareholders do uh, do in many instances you need their approval uh, so um, the sort of the chapter 11 kind of restructuring that lead to the shareholders wipe out uh, is actually um, going to be very difficult to achieve so um, it's um, it, it is I think uh, what we uh, we we, we will be interesting to observe is whether we will see a lot of um, distress, um, that, uh, the distress debt market being revived and we can see uh, funds coming in to, to take over the, um, the, the debt. Right. Uh, Mr. Relu, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah, so I don't know if the question was more referring to hostile takeovers in insolvency or outside of insolvency. So for outside of insolvency, I would say that insolvency law itself might not have a major direct impact, but some countries, uh, uh, for example, are adopting now some measures to try to prevent this, or even if we follow the debate in, in the United States, many uh, legal advisors are encouraging their firms to adopt poison pills and other anti-takeover devices, and in some European countries are also restricting, for example, foreign investments, precisely with the purpose of preventing this type of hostile acquisitions. But this is more in a scenario outside of insolvency. And in insolvency, it will be interesting to observe what my colleague, uh, Professor Wan Wai mentioned about the trading of claims. So because now the valuations are gonna be very low, and that's why uh, if, if you know as a creditor that you might not get anything, uh, between nothing and you know two percent uh, uh, two cents on the dollar, maybe you prefer the second option. 
And that's why many opportunistic uh, uh, creditors, including hedge fund and others, might want to take advantage of that. So um, in those situations, well, we will need to uh, balance several uh, interests here. We will need to balance the interests of uh, providing liquidity uh, for creditors, for debtors, for others. Uh, we will need also to prevent opportunistic behavior. So this is another aspect that we need to bear in mind. There is a, an empirical paper conducted in the United States about the desirability of trading of, of trading of claims in bankruptcy, and on average, it seems to be a good policy. It is what this professor Jared Ailias from the University of California uh, found. Um, but it will be interesting to see if uh, we see more cases about that in the current situation in Singapore to try to uh, analyze more data, uh, more cases, because as my colleague Wei mentioned, uh, we haven't observed many uh, uh, so far. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the, the stress, sorry, uh, you just mentioned that uh, the, uh, the uh, thus far, um, our secondary trading of um, the uh, in the bond market is actually uh, is the bond market is very illiquid for the secondary trading. So uh, we were not um, uh, this prior to COVID nineteen. Yeah, I think it all boils down to how much liquidity you have in the market to really sort of uh, you know. Uh, but uh, another very question that Urvashi from our centers asked is, uh, you know, the Indian government is mulling over bringing prepacks during the time of suspension of initiation of insolvency by creditors and corporate debtors. Now, what is your take on this? Um, should I try to answer the question? Uh, I seem to have lost uh, Niti. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll answer the question. Um, the prepacks I think have um, different meanings uh, in many different jurisdictions. Um, so the the version of the Singapore prepack uh, is that. Um, it is possible to abridge the time that uh, that you need to to effect a uh, restructuring um, if you can show that the uh, requisite uh, uh, that the, the requisite percentage of the debtors would agree. So uh, a classic one would be the scheme of arrangement. Uh, in a scheme of arrangement, um, uh, it takes a fairly long time to be able to effect a restructuring uh, because you must give notice to the de uh, to the debtors. So if you do a prepack, you can abridge that that time. Um, now um, the the Singapore's version of the prepack is not the same as the um, the UK version of the prepack. Um, the UK version of the prepack, uh, what uh, is done is that um, the in the UK uh, they twin the scheme of arrangement with a administration. So uh, so it operates differently. So in the Singapore version of the prepack, um, it is more of a case where you are abridging the time that is required um, in order to effect the restructuring and. Um, so, uh, but you still have to demonstrate that uh, uh, that's the uh, creditors, uh, the requisite number of creditors holding the requisite amount of the debt would agree. So, what I think um, the thus far those uh, prepacks that we saw among the listed companies, um, they have been really these are situations where uh, they relate to rather uh, the the companies with fairly fewer creditors. Um, because you have fewer creditors, it's easier to get that uh, appro uh, that approval. Uh, for another one that we observe with a uh, large number of creditors, um, the uh, the scheme manager or the insolvency practitioner actually took pains to ensure that um, that uh, that the requisite uh, number of cred uh, the creditors uh, would have voted in favor. Um, so 
so the version of the prepack here is a uh, is uh, is more of an abridgment of the time. Uh, but of course, uh, in the UK, it's different. The prepack has been seen as something which is very controversial because it can lead to the sale of the assets back to the uh, back to the controlling shareholders, uh, which then leads to um, a certain degree of unfairness. So yeah, no, I totally agree uh, with my colleague. Um, in fact, uh, even in the US, in order to include an additional jurisdiction, the concept of pre pack is also totally different. In the US, a pre pack is no more than a reorganization procedure, Chapter 11, where everything has been agreed before filing for bankruptcy. So that's why once the company files for bankruptcy, the company can make use of the restructuring tools that we have discussed uh, in order to impose the plan on the sending classes of creditors, etc. And they can emerge from bankruptcy in a few days. Sometimes I hear, oh, Chapter 11 is very efficient because unlike other organization procedures around the world, you can manage the procedure in a few weeks. It's not that the Chapter 11 itself uh, will allow you to do that. It's because the parties have agreed ex ante before filing for bankruptcy, have already agreed everything, have done these, uh, these pre-insolvency uh, restructuring discussions, and then they file for bankruptcy, and that's why they emerge from bankruptcy quickly. So that's why I get into the question. I don't know, I would need to uh, see how India is going to design these type of prepacks. Um, in order to analyze the desirability of this measure, but the concern raised in the question is if the profession, the judiciary, is the ecosystem is going to be um, prepared to deal with new restructuring tools when the ecosystem is still developing in India. Well, I would say that in times of COVID, I would agree on that point, so uh, we should not maybe innovate that much but uh, if the Indian government finally decides to suspend the um, debtor's right to, 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 to file for insolvency, maybe some simple uh, reforms that might help might include uh, a simple moratorium outside of insolvency with some restructuring tools. For example, the majority rule. Um, so in other words, that in order to approve a debt restructuring, instead of requiring 100% of the creditors on board, maybe we might require just a qualified majority or this type of simple, simple mechanisms. Because if we implement these simple pre-insolvency mechanisms, I think we can, on the one hand, address the concern that the person asking this question has, which is, Maybe the, 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 the industry is not prepared to uh, absorb these new principles, these new tools. Um, and we can also provide companies with a valuable breathing space and some restructuring tools to try to uh, save uh, value on the one hand with the moratorium and other restructuring tools. And also to promote the debt restructuring outside of insolvency through, for example, the majority rule or even the cram down provision. Professor, so the next question is restructuring within the insolvency framework. Is it desirable? There were already many companies which were highly leveraged before COVID-19. So, Professor Wang, would you like to say anybody? Um, sure. Um, uh, the uh, now um, there there has been a debate in the U.S. as to uh, which is the better approach? Do they have legislation which issues a pause button uh, or a, a suspension um, of the uh, contractual rights? Or do we go straight into an, uh, allowing the companies to restructure? So I think um, the, each country will have to determine for itself what is the right answer. Um, in the case of Singapore, uh, the decision uh, has been that uh, you want to be able to ensure that uh, many of uh, that as many of the SMEs as well as jobs can be safe uh, so um, for this kind of uh, situation, the decision is made, we enact the legislation to have that pause button, the circuit breaker. Um, this would hopefully encourage the parties to work together and therefore they don't, uh, that, that businesses will not fail and go into restructuring. Now, but um, there will be situations where um, 
if a company has the right operations but just a wrong kind of a capital structure um, and in times of COVID-19, I think those are the companies that uh, would best go into a restructuring framework and get restructured because it has still a viable under, under uh, and a, uh, 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 um, a business that can still be run. It's just that the capital structure is wrong. Now, um, for companies that have the wrong capital structure and also the wrong uh, underlying businesses, either because the businesses are already not relevant, then those will not be able to, uh, should not be able to be uh, restructured out of the uh, in, uh, in, uh, insolvency framework. I think that that is uh, where uh, we, uh, the balance that needs to be struck. Um, if we overwhelm the system with many, many bankruptcy filings, uh, uh, the effects, as uh, Professor Aurelio has pointed out, uh, many of these companies could not just wait until the time to have their day in court and they will, um, they, they will die in the process. Right, Professor Aurelio, would you like to add to? Well, so first of all, I totally agree with my colleague on, on everything that she has mentioned. So I would like just to add maybe that for certain uh, companies, depending on their size, for example, for large companies, the insolvency system will work uh, better than for micro and small firms. So that's why maybe for these type of companies, we might think about different solutions. Um, and that's why, for example, our COVID-19 uh, Act for uh, focused more on SMEs, uh, especially for some contract uh, with the banks, uh, those contracts with banks that are affected by the COVID-19 Act are those affecting uh, SMEs or companies with less than 100 million in revenues. Um, so, but for large companies, there are some authors, for example, Professor Richard Squire, uh, that he wrote a note in the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis saying that airlines should not get a bailout from the government uh, because for airlines, uh, the bankruptcy system in the U.S. actually works quite well because by using the bankruptcy system, airlines can get a haircut, airlines can get a, a, a delayed in payments, airlines can get deep financing, and if the problem is saving jobs, then the government's money should go directly to the employees and not to bail out the company itself, because in that case, the government would be indirectly bailing out the shareholders. And we all know that the shareholders of a major large corporation in the US and more and more everywhere are BlackRock, are, uh, are State Street, are Vanguard, and all of these institutional investors. So that's why there are more and more authors suggesting that we should not bail out these type of companies. And in case of providing uh, taxpayers money, the money should go directly to the employees or the people affected, but not to the shareholders. Right, Professor Shake, he says, isn't there is a risk of asset trimming and value filtrage? The scrutiny of avoidance transaction executed during the COVID period are excused. Um, oh, okay. Um, so, um, in the case of the um, during the uh, uh, the COVID nineteen uh, temporary measures act, now uh, during this period, uh, there is a defense of wrongful trading if an officer uh, knowingly contracts a debt without expectation of a uh, company being able to pay. Uh, will this lead to a perverse result where uh, the officer of the company then runs down the um, runs uh, runs down the, uh, the the assets of the company. So um, again, um, this is a policy decision that is taken, uh, which is that uh, if we don't provide a specific defense to wrongful trading, what will happen is that um, especially for the very for the larger firms where you have independent directors, they would be very inclined to stop trading, and uh, it may actually end up having a spiral uh, or cascading effect because when the company stops trading, because the directors are afraid of being held liable for wrongful trading, um, and, and then which it will affect the suppliers, the customers, um, and, 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 and therefore their own employees. So this was the uh, balance uh, that, that, uh, that, that was uh, struck. Um, now, I think um, uh, counterparties uh, to 
the companies uh, would know that these are unusual times. Uh, this is COVID-19 is an unusual time. And I think they, uh, they would be able to make the assessment because there would be uh, at least some parity of information as to uh, that we know there's unusual times and whether they want to take the risk of continuing to trade with the company. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Aurelio, would you like to add to it? Yeah, so I totally agree. So that's actually why Singapore, for example, has um, suspended the, the, the look back period for transaction avoidance uh, for companies that have had their uh, got this uh, relief. Um, or that's why, for example, um, the Czech Republic has also adopted this approach and the look back period for transaction avoidance in the Czech Republic has been suspended precisely for what the person asking the question is, is, is wondering, because in the Czech Republic, directors, uh, as soon as the company becomes insolvent, they are required to file for bankruptcy, to initiate insolvency proceedings. But because this duty has been suspended, then how are we gonna make sure that the creditors are gonna be properly protected during that period? Well, in that case, uh, under the, this new reform in the Czech Republic, this period of suspension of director's duty to file for bankruptcy is not going to count for the purpose of avoidance action. So that's why countries like Singapore, but also other countries around the world, such as the Czech Republic, have taken into account that issue and they have responded uh, accordingly. So our next question is by Divyansh. He asked, the pandemic will test to what extent modern insolvency laws is fit to deal with insolvencies of complex multinational enterprise group, for example, airlines. How is Singapore geared up for that? Um, okay, um, so uh, the, um, the reforms have been made to the Singapore insolvency framework um, in 2017. Um, the aim then was uh, to make Singapore a restructuring hub um, and to attract um, the companies, especially MNCs, uh, to restructure in Singapore uh, using the tools that are available, the modern restructuring tools. Um, so it, 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 uh, the, now, of course, the aim at the time was uh, really for, uh, to promote uh, the, the idea of a restructuring hub. Um, will the law stand the test of time uh, through, uh, especially through this pandemic, uh, well, that I think uh, it it still remains to be seen. Um, but there are several uh, tools that have been put in place uh, since twenty seventeen. Um, so some of them, which um, Professor Aurelio has uh, mentioned, um, the, uh, they include um, things that have we have a a, a a fairly advanced moratorium or automatic stay. Um, the rescue financing, um, the availability um, of um, the, uh, sorry, the availability of debt financing or rescue financing. Um, well, the, uh, we also have um, the uh, uh, an advanced moratorium that covers um, the stay of the actions, not only against the company, but also uh, against the other, uh, the, the, uh, the other companies within the group. Uh, so this would be uh, uh, the uh, interesting times uh, to, to be able to see how uh, 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 whether that we actually will see a lot of uh, filings. Um, my my suspicion is that um, the uh, in terms of uh, whether we'll see the filings immediately, uh, I, I doubt it. I, I suspect if there are any filings, it will be really after the circuit breaker. Uh, the uh, because uh, right now I think it's more of a pause button uh, to get uh, to allow the companies to uh, to be able to evaluate uh, where they are um, and I think also to uh, and also the creditors will also want to uh, be, to be able to uh, if, uh, to try and work out solutions with the uh, with, uh, with the with the debtors. And for um, say airlines, well, um, I think uh, those are considered uh, essential services here. So, for example, uh, uh, for S Singapore Airlines, uh, that that it is undergoing a rights issue with with support from Tamasic. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Van. Urvashi, do we have more questions or? Uh, Ma'am, we have two more questions. Okay. So, and either or, uh, both the panelists could answer. 
and then we can have the final word. Yeah, please go ahead. With the question. Question. Uh, the longer term effects due to COVID-19 and consumer habits and commercial practices like uh, switching to online rather than physical marketplace. How would the insolvency law uh, handle this? Because the industry is changing rapidly. So it would be difficult for the industry to regain their market share even after COVID-19. So how would uh, the insolvency laws and the countries manage this? Ms. Aurelia, would you like to take this one? Yeah, sure. So um, I definitely think that the COVID-19 crisis is going to teach us so many lessons even for insolvency and for insolvency legislator because uh, it's going to test uh, you know the desirability of some of our rules but we also need to take into account that these rules are going to be tested in extreme times so that's why the fact that some of them might not work in times of COVID doesn't mean that are necessarily undesirable and the other way around but I think uh, it's definitely going to help us think about so many issues, uh, including our behavior, consumer habits, commercial practices, as it is mentioned in the question. And, and I think it can even help us think about many insolvency rules. Because for example, uh, I mean, for, for uh, I've been criticizing for a while um, the duty to file for bankruptcy in certain jurisdictions or the subordination of shareholder loans. Some people have also criticized wrongful trading provisions or, or uh, other provisions. And actually some of these provisions have been suspended right now. So maybe, I don't know, but it will be interesting to observe if after the COVID-19 crisis, some countries decide just to keep the suspension and to make the suspension uh, permanent. Um, it wouldn't be the first time we have observed that in many legislations uh, where uh, insolvency laws have been enacted in extreme times and actually it has uh, you know, stayed there for a while. So I think uh, it will change things, and, but it will be interesting to see uh, what exactly is going to change. Professor Van, would you like to add to it? Uh, I agree with what Professor Aurelio has said um, that um, that uh, it, it is uh, it remains to be seen as to uh, what are some of the changes that are likely to be permanent. Right. So um, we can take the next and that yes. is as a learning from the crisis. Would you see any uh, permanent changes being made to insolvency regimes? Because in most of the nation, it's just the temporary suspension or temporary amendments. But what's your take on it? And this is the last one. Savannah or Yeah, so basically this is my, my thoughts here are very similar to what I just mentioned because the question seems to have some similarities. Um, I would say that uh, yes, probably because we're going to learn with this crisis some of the temporary changes uh, particularly to some insolvency laws um, might end up, I'm not sure if necessarily amending the insolvency framework um, in the future, but at least it's going to make legislators think twice about the desirability of some of their insolvency rules. Um, very interesting discussion we had. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I would say that is for, it was one of the most stimulating discussion we had. And we discussed a variety of things starting from, you know, where the changes are being made. Will it be there for longer? And, um, you know, I think uh, the quality of discussions is only getting better with every webinar that we do. Um, so if there are no questions, uh, uh, you know, can we close the session, Urvashi? So no further questions, ma'am. Right, so let me close this session uh, and with uh, you know, big gratitude to the panelists, Professor Van and Professor Rello. Uh, you know, you all are so busy and still you agreed to do this session for us. I can't thank you enough. And uh, to the to our viewers, uh, you know, we have the most, we had one of the uh, best viewers today.
the practitioners, the industry experts, the scholars who joined us today, and they had asked such good questions that it made the discussion very enriching. And uh, of course, my heartfelt thanks to Urushi. She has been the force behind these Friday webinars. And Mr. Abhijit, uh, who is our IT uh, uh, person, who is the who is the person who's handling the whole technology. Uh, any glitches, I take the blame on me. But uh, Mr. Abhijit has been doing this uh, live streaming and everything so wonderfully. Thanks, Urushi. Thanks, uh, thanks the participants and. But before we close, I would like to just have last words from Professor Van and Rello, and then close the session. Professor Van, would you like to go first? Uh, yes. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Diti. Um, this has been uh, a very stimulating um, discussion, um, and um, uh, the certainly the questions that are, have been asked are extremely interesting and will give us room for thoughts uh, as we uh, go uh, as we. Uh, continue our research in relation to comparative insolvency law, um, comparative restructuring laws, um, and uh, it, it will be very interesting to see um, the, uh, the the future directions as to how the law reformers as well as the legislators will take into account um, the the lessons that we learn um, going forward. So um, once again, um, thank you for uh, inviting us to be present uh, in in the in the webinar. Uh, it has been a great um, honor able to uh, share our uh, uh, talk uh, with a wider audience um, and um, we hope that uh, the uh, that the seminar has been interesting and fulfilling for the participants and I cannot agree more with my colleague professor one way Oh, uh, so thank you so much for the wonderful session. And uh, uh, to, my, to our viewers, we'd like to let you know that next Friday we're doing a session on restructuring on time, in times of COVID, where you'll, be, uh, you'll get to hear some leading Indian practitioners. And um, do stay tuned. Professor Van, Professor Rello would also send you the invite. And if your calendar allows, do join us. And uh, thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.